Welcome to PowerPoint Tuesday, your weekly deep dive into the Word of God. I'm your host, Pastor Jeremiah, here to guide you through the sacred scriptures with clarity and insight. Get ready for an enlightening journey of faith brought to you through the power of PowerPoint. Let's journey together into the heart of the Bible right here on PowerPoint Tuesday. Uh, as we uh, prepare to get started, I want to remind you again of our objective for this study. Our objective is that um, this eight-part Bible study on the Holy Spirit aims to deepen our, undersp- our understanding of the Holy Spirit's role and activity in our lives as interpreted from a Wesleyan perspective through a combination of scriptural exploration, historical insights, and practical applications, we will discover how the Holy Spirit empowers, transforms, and sustains us in our Christian journey. We will also reflect on key Wesleyan themes such as prevenient grace, sanctification, and the means of grace, ultimately seeking a more profound and personal experience of the Holy Spirit's work among us. Amen. Praise God. And so what you'll uh, hear and see again as we teach on the Holy Spirit, is it really coming from uh, the Wesleyan and and Methodist perspective as we teach it as uh, it was taught from uh, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, and that theological perspective. Amen. Uh, Just so that you understand um, where this perspective is coming from. Praise the Lord, Sister Rhonda Keith. Thank you so much for tuning in with us this evening. I want to quickly review what we discussed last week in our introduction. Uh, in our introduction, we primarily focused on the nature of God from the perspective of the Trinity. So we uh, attempted to do the best we could in defining the mystery of the Trinity. And uh, in summary, we really discussed the different ways God is revealed. As Father, he's revealed himself as a creative power. As Son, he's revealed himself as a redemptive presence. And as Holy Spirit, he reveals himself as a guiding influence. And what we understood is that that is not necessarily uh, something that happens concurrently, but it's something that happens or excuse me, something that happens uh, consecutively, but could be concurrent and overlap in any stage in a person's life. At any given point in any one person's life, he will uh, show and reveal himself as a creative power. And at any given point in a person's life, he can reveal himself as a redemptive presence. And at any given point, he he reveals himself to us as a guiding influence, as the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And so uh, the purpose last week was for us to really get an understanding of the nature of God by, from the perspective of the Trinity so that we can uh, really uh, be comfortable uh, the best we can with our understanding of the mystery of the Trinity and how it lends itself to the theology of the Holy Spirit. And then we discussed the Holy Spirit's presence fulfills God's will and purpose for our lives. And so what we really wanted to come away understanding last week is the purpose of the Holy Spirit within us is to fulfill God's purpose for us. Amen. And that is how we uh, introduced our study. And now we're really going to get ready to dig in. Praise the Lord. Sister Christy Morris and Sister Carol Burton, thank you so much for tuning in with us this evening. Amen. So um, as we look at that Uh, review, I also want to really talk about what we're going to discuss tonight. Tonight, we're going to be discussing uh, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, specifically the Holy Spirit at work in creation, the Holy Spirit at work in the people of Israel, and the importance for our spiritual renewal. In In other words, understanding the perspective of the Holy Spirit Uh, from the Old Testament perspective will help us uh, also inform us of his importance in our spiritual renewal. Amen. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the first thing that we should really take away uh, and start looking at, praise the Lord, uh, First Lady LaRonda Burton, good to see you blessing our broadcast this evening. Amen. Amen. The first thing that we want to discover is the definition of spirit, the definition of spirit. 
the definition in the Hebrew of the word spirit is ruach, ruach, and it means wind. It means breath. It means air in motion. It, it, it lends itself to animating or, or giving something life, power, and energy. Uh, when we think of uh, an, an inanimate object becoming animate, we think of it coming to life by some degree of force. And so the idea of spirit is that life-giving vitality that brings life to something. Uh, the first, the very first instance of the word ruach appears in the second verse of the entire Bible. Genesis 1 and 2 tells us that the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The spirit of God was hovering over the surface of of the waters. And so the first thing that we see is the creative power of God's spirit in creation. The creative power of God's spirit in creation. And so what we see uh, is, of him being at work in creation is that um, his spirit brings shape and form. We saw that uh, darkness was on the face of the deep, but his spirit was hovering over the waters and played a part of bringing shape and form to the earth. Secondly, uh, he brought meaning out of emptiness and darkness, brought meaning out of emptiness and darkness. In other words, there was no life in the emptiness of the earth. There was no life in the emptiness of the universe. God's spirit brought about light in the darkness, uh, 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 substance to the emptiness, amen, uh, uh, order to the chaos. Uh, that is what the spirit of God did. The, the, the spirit of God is creative life-giving power creative life-giving power. And so it wasn't just an aimless breath in motion. It was a breath that gave life and gave shape to the earth and to humanity and created a form out of formlessness. Amen. And the uh, Spirit of God uh, created form out of chaos, created form out of chaos and then also giving life to humankind we understand that when he created not only when he created earth but he created man and the bible says he breathed um into uh the man uh life from his nostrils amen and so uh even when he extracted uh when he created man out of the dust of the earth uh, he was still nothing until God breathed life into him. When he created woman from the womb of man, she was nothing until God breathed life into her. And that is when that, uh, that animation, that humanity uh, came into play uh, in both the earth, form out of formlessness, and in humanity, uh, life out of lifelessness. Amen. So God's breath is creative breath. God's breath is creative breath and it is creative power. It's creative power. Um, when we think of life, when we think of how life is sustained, we also have to remember that uh, we only know life from our perspective. We don't know li our life before our life, right? Uh, so our life had to start somewhere, and that is through the creative breath of God. Other developments of science may serve to enhance, it may serve to improve, and it may serve to prolong life. You have artificial lungs, you have oxygen, you have a lot of things that help to support and preserve the breath that already exists. But only God has and had the ability to breathe creative life into nature and in humanity where no breath ever existed. 
the only thing that we can do in our limited capacity is try to use our resources to sustain a life that already exists. But God's creative breath brought life to existence, amen, where it never existed before. And so from the Old Testament perspective, the Hebrews believed that Ruach not only gave life, but that the spirit brought meaning and purpose to one's daily existence. So this means that God remains actively involved in creation, right? He wasn't simply the initiator of creation. He didn't just start something and then stop and leave the rest uh, to move on on its own. There are other religious perspectives that really take this approach, such as the Gnostics. Now, we learned a lot about the Gnostics in our previous studies, but the Gnostics believe that God is so perfect that he cannot involve himself in the unholiness of humanity, and which is why uh, man needed angels to serve as a conduit to reach God, because God could not involve himself in the world. Uh, or deism uh, affirms a creator and affirms a divine creator, but believes that once uh, God created earth, he left the earth to uh, run itself, right? So the only thing that God did was create the earth, and then there is nothing else that he is involved in subsequent to that. Or the idea of pantheism that believes that God is nature and nature is God and that there is really no um, active involvement, but the earth is God, a God into itself. Nature is a God into itself. And, and so from the perspective and the Hebrew perspective of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, it was they, they go in with the understanding that not only was God involved in creation, but he remains involved with his creation, right? He didn't leave us to fend for ourselves. He is actively involved continuously with us. Uh, one scripture that really helps to highlight this can be found in Psalm 104, 24 through 31. Psalm 104, 24 through 31 says, O oh Lord, what a variety of things you have made. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the ocean, vast and wide, teeming with life of every kind, both large and small. See the ships sailing along in Leviathan, which you made to play in the sea. They all depend on you to give them food as they need it. When you supply it, they gather it. You open your hand to feed them and they are richly satisfied. But if you turn away from them, they panic. When you take away their breath, they die and turn again to dust. When you give them your breath, it, life is created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord continue forever. The Lord takes pleasure in all he has made. That was Psalm 104, 24 through 31 from the New Living Translation. And this really tells us that not only did God create the earth, but we are eternally dependent upon God for our continued uh, sustenance. We need him to continue to live. We don't just need him to create our life. We need him to maintain our life. We didn't just need him to create existence. We need him to maintain existence. Amen. And so the Hebrew culture in the Old Testament uh, understood God through his spirit to be actively involved uh, in our lives, even subsequent to creation. So the spirit of God from the very beginning was active as a creative force in creation, breathing life into creation, breathing life into humanity. And because of that, uh, the, the Hebrew perspective understands that it doesn't stop there, but it continues in his active, his active involvement in mankind. And so now that we understand that the Holy Spirit uh, didn't just start at Pentecost, right? The whole, this idea of the Holy Spirit didn't just start in the New Testament. It is not solely a New 
Testament uh, perspective, but really we find the root and understanding of the Holy Spirit as a creative power, a creative breath at the very beginning of our existence and remains that way being actively involved in our lives and in our day-to-day walk as mankind. And so that leads us to really now start discussing not only the Spirit's work in creation, but the Spirit's work in mankind. And there are five things that we can see in terms of how God uh, 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 used his Spirit to be active in and with mankind. We can see him... uh, using the Holy Spirit to fill man with the power of skill and capability. Uh, Exodus 31, verses 2 through 5. Exodus 31, verses 2 through 5 says this from the New Living Translation. Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, I have filled him with the spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving uh, in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. Now, this is just one example of how the Bible speaks to God uh, filling an individual with the Holy Spirit for a specific task or a specific skill that fulfills his purpose. Right now, many of us have talents and skills, but we don't necessarily use them to fulfill God's purpose. At that point, it's only a talent. But when the Holy Spirit uses that 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 talent or that skill uh, for His purpose, then He fills us with His uh, His Spirit to enhance that talent and that skill to fulfill His purpose. And that's when it becomes an anointing. Before the Holy Spirit, it's a talent and a skill. With the Holy Spirit, is an it, it is an anointing to fulfill. God's purpose. And so we see an example of God working within mankind to give him special skill and capability. And in in these instances, it it really happened sporadically. It was was something that happened uh, with one person for a specific period or a specific purpose or time, another person for a specific period and a specific purpose and time. And we can see that same instance when we see God being active in leadership. God being active in leadership. If we look at uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 16, Numbers chapter 11, verse 16, we see the example of God uh, filling Moses with the Holy Spirit for the purposes of leadership. Numbers 11, verses 16 and 17 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather before me 70 men who are recognized as elders and leaders in Israel. Bring them to the tabernacle and stand uh, to stand there with you. I will come down and talk to you there. I will take some of the spirit that is upon you, and I will put the spirit upon them also. They will bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So this is when... Uh, Jethro gave Moses the advice that he can't judge and lead the, all of these people uh, by himself. And so he needed leaders to help him in that effort. And so he told Moses to find 70 men that would serve as leaders and elders for the people of Israel and that he would put his spirit upon them so that they would be able to judge the people in support of Moses as leader. Uh, We can see another example of that when uh, Moses was about to die and Joshua was about to take over and succeed Moses as leader. The Holy Spirit was upon him to lead the nation of Israel, the people of Israel into the promised land. And he was anointed for that specific purpose by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for skill and capability for leadership, and then more specifically, we see the Holy Spirit active in the people of Israel, which helped them form their national identity. 
which helped them fulfill their national identity. We see throughout the history of Israel, because of God's involvement with them, they became, un they, they had this understanding and preoccupation of the, of the covenant that God made, especially with them. And so they felt a degree of exclusivity with their God, and that was their national identity that God had specifically chosen them out of all other nations, out of all other people. So the the uh, the Israelite, the Israel people, uh, the, the people of Israel's identity uh, was based on God's personal involvement and covenant with them exclusively. Uh, and so they uh, understood God's spirit and God's presence as presiding over the destiny of Israel. So not just what he did, not just what he does, but what he will do. God's spirit's involvement in the people of Israel, they saw it as an ultimate uh, 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 future destiny for who uh, the people of Israel would become. Amen. And then we see uh, also the Holy Spirit inspiring prophets and psalmists and giving inspiration and, and revealing how God continues to involve himself in our lives. When we read the both the major and the minor prophets and we read poetic literature such as uh, Psalms and um, uh, Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, we see and, and, and we read prophets such as um, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and, and the other minor prophets, we see them speaking about God and speaking to us about God regarding his ongoing involvement in the existence of mankind. And I, I love what Psalm 139 says is a perfect example of how God is continually involved in our lives. Because if you go and look at Psalm 139, it reads this way from the New Living Translation. It says, oh, Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know, when I sit down or when I stand up, you know, my thoughts, even when I'm far away, you see me when I travel and when I rest at home, you know, everything I do, you know what I am going to say, even before I say it, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. And it goes on to really describe and highlight how wherever we are, God sees us. God is intimately involved in our lives. God is actively involved in our lives. And this, this just didn't start with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This just didn't start when Jesus said that he would leave us another comforter. The Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament uh, people of Israel understood the Spirit of God being actively involved with his people for his purpose. Amen. And so, and then we really start to see how there was a shift in how the uh, Hebrews understood the Holy Spirit's involvement. And we see that in, in the intertestamental period, the intertestamental period, that is the period uh, from the uh, end of the major prophets and in the Bible, that would be Malachi. That would be between the period of Malachi and the beginning of the Gospels. And that would be about a 400 year period, which uh, are also considered the 400 silent years. This was a period where God uh, did not give any new revelation. He was not speaking through any prophets. He was not speaking through any psalmists. He was not speaking to people. That's not to say that his spirit was not involved. But when we think about how the prophets and the, the priests and the, the, the leaders of the nation of Israel, they really shifted away from the active nature of God in their lives. Um, there was believed to be no new revelations from God. Not that there couldn't be, 
it was believed to be that case. And so the Jews believed that because there were no new revelations, that the age of prophecy was over and that his spirit had been withdrawn from the daily affairs of man. So they believed that, of course, God existed and that God was uh, still uh, watching over mankind, but his active involvement in mankind, the way they had uh, known him through history, was no longer the case. And so then, for that 400-year period, we see the leaders of Israel really focusing on the legalities of leading a nation, uh, uh, a, a, a theistic nation, right? A nation under God, but they, they didn't do it under the active influence of the Holy Spirit. They were really structuring a framework for a nation. And that's where we get people like Pharisees and Sadducees and people that became legal experts in the law that really became political uh, leaders, uh, religious political leaders that introduced legalism into Judaism, which is what Jesus preached against, um, righteousness by the law. And so what we see happening in that intertestamental period is a shift away from the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that shift, we see uh, ideologies and philosophies about God being framed because there was a belief that God was not no longer speaking uh, anymore. And so uh, what we see are really two things out of this summary is that the spirit of God either coming suddenly or intermittently for the purposes of skill, capability, and leadership, or the spirit of God resting permanently for the purpose of relationship and inspiration. And we see that actively uh, described throughout many scriptures in the Old Testament. And I've only named a few and shared a few scriptures. Uh, those of you who have the book, uh, you see several examples throughout the chapter of uh, of examples of God giving skill and capability or leadership or national identity and, and examples from the prophets and the psalmists uh, identifying how God is actively involved in the lives of his people. Uh, and so when we think about that, then we have to understand where we come away with this term, Holy Spirit, where we come away with this term, Holy Spirit, because Throughout the majority of the Old Testament, when we hear the term spirit with reference to God, we only hear it in the terms of the spirit of God or God's spirit or his spirit, your spirit. We only hear that. But the term Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is only used three times. It's only used three times, twice in Isaiah 62, 10 and 11, and once in Psalm 51. And so I'm going to read to you uh, those two examples um, in Isaiah uh, 62, verses 10 and 11. It says this. I have my physical Bible this time because my iPad has died. And so uh, I'm unable to use that. But Isaiah 62, 10 and 11, New Living Translation says, The Lord has sent this message to every land. Tell the people of Israel, look, your savior is coming. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. They will be called the holy people and the people redeemed by the Lord. Look, your savior is coming. Where did I go? I'm sorry, I started at 11. Let me start back at 10. Go through the gates. Prepare the highway for my people to return. Smooth out the road, pull out the boulders, raise this flag for all the nations to see. The Lord has sent this very message to every land. Tell the people of Israel, look, your savior is coming. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. They will be called the holy people, the people redeemed by the Lord. And Jerusalem will be known as the desirable place and the city no longer forsaken. Um, and I believe that there's another translation that actually uses the term Holy Spirit uh, in terms of uh, speaking of God's spirit. Um, and you know what? The reason why that didn't sound right is because it should have been Isaiah 63, 
verses 10 and 11. So please accept my apologies for uh, that misreading. Uh, Isaiah 63 verses 10 and 11 says, but they rebelled against him and grieved his Holy Spirit. So they became their enemy and fought against them. Then they remembered those days of old when Moses led his people out of Egypt. They cried out, where is the one who brought Israel through the sea with Moses as their shepherd? Where is the one who sent his Holy Spirit to be among his people? So that is the proper reading of Isaiah 63, 10 and 11. And then Psalm 51, verse 11, when uh, David is uh, crying out in response to being called out for his sin uh, against God with Bathsheba, in his uh, prayer of repentance, he says in Psalm 51, 11, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So when we think of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, we really have to speak, think of him uh, in the, from the perspective of the Old Testament before the New Testament and New Covenant activities in the Gospels and Acts ever existed. These events and these writings took place before the Gospels. These events and writings took place before the, the activity of the Holy Spirit and Acts. So we really need to read these things from the immediate perspective of the Old Testament. And so in doing that, we need to take uh, the uh, Christian perspective of the Holy Spirit out of it and read into it the Hebrew perspective prior to the Gospels into it. And what we understand is that in this term, Holy Spirit, the emphasis on these references are on the Spirit of God imparting holiness, or the Holy Spirit in these passages means the spirit of holiness or the holiness of God. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not take the only resource I have to live for you, that your spirit of holiness. Uh, I grieved the Holy Spirit of God, or I grieved him by not uh, living out for the spirit of holiness. And so when we see the terms Holy Spirit in these uh, three instances, it's speaking of the holiness of God and the power of God to impart holiness upon us. Amen. And so that's re really what we should take away in, in the overarching theme of God's involvement in creation and God's involvement in mankind is God wants to be involved in our lives in order to impart his purpose into us, his, in, in, in order to impart meaning into our lives through a spirit of holiness. Amen. And we see that in the Old Testament, and that should help inform how we experience him in the New Testament. Now, how does that speak to uh, our spiritual renewal? How did, what, what are the lessons that we learn from our understanding about God's involvement in creation and in mankind? Well, first we should understand this. If God created nature, then he is affected by its use and misuse. If God created mankind, he is affected by their actions. Think about it. If you created anything and it stops working, you're disappointed. If you created anything and you gave it to someone and they misuse it or abuse it, that affects you, that disappoints you because of what you did to create it and the care you put into sharing it with someone else. In the same way, God created uh, man for himself. And so when man is either doing well or not doing well, God is affected by that. And that is because he is actively involved in our lives. Amen. God's care for us should inspire praise and faithfulness because God's primary concern is to make us righteous. God didn't create us just to leave us to ourselves. 
God created us to live in relationship with him. And therefore his efforts throughout generation to generation is to be involved with us so that we can experience that relationship with him. And so those things that we do that show faithfulness or those things that we do that show unfaithfulness directly affect God because his spirit is actively and intimately involved with us so that uh, uh, he wants to continue to have relationship and, and for us to experience that spiritual renewal. If God didn't want to have anything to do with us, then he wouldn't be actively involved. The fact that he created us speaks to the fact that he wants to be intimately involved with us and in our daily lives. And so it is through his spirit and through this purpose that we find our purpose. God created nature and God created man for a reason not to leave us to our own devices, but to have a relationship with us. This means that he is intimately and continuously involved with us. And the Hebrews of the Old Testament believe this so much that they looked forward to a great leader who was filled with that same spirit that would bring about national salvation. God's spirit was so intimately involved with the people of Israel that they looked forward to a leader that had that same spirit who would be the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament belief in God's ongoing involvement and care gave them something to look forward to. If the Hebrew perspective of the Old Testament believed that God was not actively involved, then they would not look forward to something else coming. But because of what they see and how they experienced God, remember we talked last week about not, the, not trying to uh, experience God by the definition, but to define God by the experience. And when we do that, we are able to see and experience God in a way that is actively involved in our lives. And that is when we can truly experience spiritual renewal because God is with us day by day. Everything about God's actions with our lives are new. Everything about God's actions with our lives are fresh. Everything uh, about God's involvement in us is, is, is about uh, uh, breathing new life in every part of our existence. His purpose, and thank you for reiterating that, Sister Keith, God's primary concern is to make us righteous. And in order to do that, he has to be actively involved in our lives. Amen. He was involved in creation and now he's involved with the created. He created us and now he's involved with his creation. He didn't just leave his created thing to exist uh, without guidance. He created us so that he could be involved with us, so that he can love us, so that he can give us purpose, so that he could give us meaning, so that he could make us righteous, so that we could fulfill his purpose for creating us in the first place. Amen. Uh, I hope that uh, helps us really gain a great understanding of God's involvement and acts uh, uh, presence in the Old Testament, because that helps to inform how we understand him, his presence and activity in the New Testament. So in summary, here's what we should take away. Uh, God's spirit gave life to creation. And not only that, God's spirit breathed life into mankind. And because of that, God is, continuous, God is continuously involved in his creation with his spirit. And by being involved with us continuously, he gives us purpose and meaning. The Old Testament helps us to understand that God was never a distant creator. Through his spirit, he was active in the lives of his creation, helping to give us purpose and meaning and ultimately helping us and them to be righteous. And so this perspective helps inform our new covenant perspective of God and how the Holy Spirit is represented in the gospels and the teachings of Jesus Christ, which we will begin next week when we begin the chapter on the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. Amen. Uh, I hope this was a, a, a good and insightful teaching to you because in order for us to understand the Holy Spirit, we have to understand the history of the Holy Spirit throughout mankind and throughout creation. Amen. I pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you and I pray that you continue 
to join with us over the next several weeks as we study the Holy Spirit in the uh, Wesleyan heritage. Amen. So let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for what we have learned tonight. We thank you, Father God, that we have learned of not only your involvement in creating but your involvement in creation. And we thank you, Lord God, that your perfect life-giving breath breathed life into a formless mass to bring an order out of chaos so that you could breathe life into mankind and be actively involved in our lives. And now that we know that this was that your spirit is not an isolated creative activity, but a continuous renewal in our lives throughout the history of man. Let us look forward, Father God, to learning how you continue to intend to involve yourselves in our lives from the New Testament on. And so, Lord God, we ask that we uh, continue to pray that your Holy Spirit plays an active and powerful and energetic role in our lives, Father God, so that we could fulfill our purpose and find meaning in our lives and that we will continue to strive to live out the righteous standard that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on PowerPoint Tuesday with Pastor Jeremiah. Remember, the word of God is a light unto your path. Until next time, stay blessed, stay inspired, and let God's wisdom guide you. This is Pastor Jeremiah saying, I love you, God loves you, Keep yourselves in the love of God.